Good morning. It's AM 790 WNIS, and I've been looking forward to this. Here's a gentleman that I watch on TV all the time on MSNBC. When I watch uh, Chris Matthews and Rachel Maddow and all those folks, and Lawrence O'Donnell is now on a 10. And the Virginia Beach Forum presents Howard Feynman. And this is going to be tomorrow, tomorrow night at 745. And our own Dave Parker, who comes on right after me, is going to be the MC for all this, at the Sandler Center for the Performing Arts. All right, you can get your tickets online at www. Dot cox ticks c o x t i x dot com and if you need a phone number the number to call seven five seven five zero four four three two seven and mr Feynman will uh have the opportunity to give his thoughts on uh, the issues of the day without being interrupted constantly by Chris Matthews. But I kid. <laughs> Let's move on. He's a senior political editor at the Huffington Post, which I read every day. And uh, prior to his move to the Huffington Post, uh, Mr. Feynman was Newsweek's chief political correspondent. He's got a very distinguished resume, but I want to talk to the guy. Let's get to it. Howard Feynman, good morning, sir. How are you today? Hi, good morning. I'm very, very well, thank you. All right. Well, it's, I know you can only be on for like 15, 20 minutes, but still, I want to thank you for coming on because uh, I enjoy watching you with Chris Matthews and MSNBC and that roundtable discussion you guys have. And, thank you. And the Huffington Post, you guys do a, a, a good job. What do you let you talk? But, but I'm a host myself. I know how that is. Now, what I wanted to ask you is when you look at something like with the Huffington Post, we saw this story with Herman Cain, with Politico. Uh, Howard Feynman, what are the standards? Like if you were going to go and Howard's going to improve a story uh, and, and Huffington Post is going to run with this story, uh, when it comes to sources, uh, whether or not it's something that you want to run, you want to go with, what standards do you, do you apply? Well, uh, I try to apply the standards that, that I've learned over uh, 35 or more years in journalism, and those are to be to be accurate and to be confident that you are adding to the public discussion. Mm-hmm. So there are two phases of it. One, one, one is the, if you if you will, the mechanics. I mean, <clears throat> you've got to have sources. If you have a story, especially a controversial one, especially about. Uh, an important issue or public figure, you need uh, to have more than one source. You need to have more than one person alleging a set of facts. You need to be able to corroborate them to the extent that you can. You need to exhaust every avenue, uh, reasonable avenue, but every every practical avenue to make sure you've got your facts straight and you aren't just going off with an accusation by one person against somebody he doesn't like. And then you also have, so you have to get the mechanics straight, and then you also have to, to weigh the value of the piece in terms of the public discussion. I mean, we come across things about people running for president, for example, that, uh, and I won't go into details, but that aren't really uh, worth public discussion. Not everything, at least in our view, mm-hmm. uh, not everything uh, adds to public debate. And you have to be reasonable about it, and you have to be, mature about it because uh we're trying to be a uh contribute positive things to the national discussion at the Huffington Post. Well said, sir. Now, uh, with anonymous sources, is it okay to run with the story if the sources are not anonymous to you? If you think they're credible, but yet you will say it's an anonymous source. I think it can, I think it can be valid. But I think the use of anonymous sources uh, is is a practice that's really easy to abuse. And if you're in journalism, you have to be very careful about it. If you're going to make some big accusation about somebody, uh, and you're going to use an uh, anonymous source or sources, first of all, you have to know everything about that source. Second, there has to be more than one, uh, and they have to corroborate the same thing. And it has to be of sufficient value to the public that it's worth uh, it's it's worth uh, relying on the accusations of someone whose name is not is not used in the story. So you have to you have to use judgment here. You have to use best judgment. And um, I, th- I think it can be troublesome if it, it's been many cases in the media where we, we've abused those privileges. Mm-hmm. Howard Feynman is our guest, and I'll tell you more about how you can see him tomorrow night. Now. I can't help it. This story with Herman Cain, the interview with Libya, the stuff that he said about Muslims, it strikes me as incredibly funny. And so I've been having fun with it. Not fun that this guy could be president, but then I say to myself, you know, the way it is now, I wonder, 
Uh, and I'm not comparing Herman Cain to Abraham Lincoln, but you know, you're a student of history, that Lincoln was known to perhaps make a comment that was inappropriate, a joke after hearing something that had happened. And I wonder sometimes if guys like me, you know, you look at this and it's just so funny to us, or it's so amusing that this guy's actually running for president, whatever, that you can overdo it because no one could come out looking good in the scrutiny that we give them. Well, I think there are two things there. Uh, one is uh, it's a good thing for a candidate to know uh, a lot about public issues. And you can't joke your way out of ignorance. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that's true in Herman Cain's case, mm-hmm. but you know, uh, the thing about Abraham Lincoln, yeah, he made a lot of jokes, but he was also a, a deeply read and well-trained lawyer. He also knew his way around uh, the commerce of the day. I mean, by the time he became a national figure, he was deeply steeped in the traditions of politics and knew a whole heck of a lot about uh, the history of them. Uh, but it is true that the scrutiny is so intense that uh, I think a sense of, uh, the sense of humor is what originally got Herman Cain noticed. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wrote about him favorably for that, because here's a guy who seemed comfortable in public, who seemed to enjoy the public discourse, and who wanted to have some fun with it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, for sure. But you, you can't, you can't, it's good to have a sense of humor. It's necessary for survival in politics. It's appealing to voters, but you can't use it to, if, if that's going to be your main calling card, you're not going to be taken seriously. Well, and I think you said, didn't you just say you, you found him fun and it was great to talk about right, it, but right. you don't necessarily consider him... Seriously. No, you're absolutely correct. Well said. Well said. Uh, One of the things, though, that um, we see Newt Gingrich, and we know that it's probably today we're going to hear all the stories about the many marriages and all these other things with him. And I was thinking, uh, were I deathly ill with a heart problem and a heart surgeon, I would want the best heart surgeon. And if it turned out that he was an adulterer, that would not be a concern of mine. And, but I, I don't know what the answer is to that. Like, sometimes I think that perhaps there might be someone out there. Like, in this current climate, whether you like FDR or not, he certainly was one of the most productive men in American history. And I doubt very much in this climate that he even would have been Secretary of the Navy. And so I, I, I don't know how we can keep from disqualifying so many qualified people for things that were, to somebody who was really going to save our lives as an individual, would, would be no concern at all. Uh, well, I'll return the compliment. That's very well said. Uh, I think the I think that the times will reach out and find people at hand. Um, the way things are set up now in the Republican primaries um, and in the Republicans' search for a standard bear to take on President Obama, uh, I think Republican voters are going to be in a mood to overlook. Uh, if they, where thing, as given where things stand right now, they're going to be in a mood to overlook a lot of Newt Gingrich's personal history. Mm-hmm. And the reason is twofold. First of all, <clears throat> there's maybe two-thirds of the Republican electorate that simply just can't stand the idea of nominating Mitt Romney. Cause they don't think he's a conservative. They think he's a flip-flopper. They think he's an elitist. They, they just don't like him. They, they, and they're being, you have to practically put a gun to their head to get them to support him. And they won't. Uh, and meanwhile, there's a frantic search for a true conservative standard bearer to take on Romney in the primaries and to take on Barack Obama. Various of them have come forward. Uh, Michelle Bachman come, came forward, fell short. Rick Perry came forward, fell short. Herman Cain uh, is still doing well in the polls, but as your comments reflected, not everybody's really taking him seriously as a future president. Mm-hmm. So you kind of rummage through the uh, bin there. And here's Newt Gingrich, who was Speaker of the House, after all, uh, who has tremendously uh, deep political and legislative experience, whether you agree with him or not, and who in the current context looks great because the method for picking the Republican nominee seems to have turned into a ser- is nothing more or less than a series of TV shows. It's a series of debates. Mm-hmm. And I know having covered Newt Gingrich in the Congress years ago, he is one heck of a debater. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he's a very smart guy with very deep knowledge. He's a, he's a Ph.D. in history. He's written 15 books. Uh, he speaks uh, quickly off the tongue and, and can speak it for hours about almost any topic in public life. 
if I were Mitt Romney, I wouldn't want to end up in a one-on-one debate with Newt Gingrich. Yeah. So it's, a, in a way, oddly inevitable, uh, given what's happened to the other conservatives, that it would be Newt Gingrich's turn, and now it's Newt Gingrich's turn. Let's see if he can survive it between now and the beginning of the primaries in January. One more. I, I always think there's a, a balance, Howard, but a lot of my listeners do not, and that is it'll come up with the liberal media bias. And I'll say, well, the New York Times, yes, in the Northeast is certainly very powerful, but it doesn't play down here that well. And there are so many different ways uh, to get the news, but why am I answering the question? You're used to that. People people asking the question and answering, you're too used to that. <laughs> liberal media bias, just address that issue if you would. Well, I, I always like to say... Uh, the truth, which is, of course, uh, but the liberal media bias, as you were saying, no longer encompasses all the media, even if it ever did. Uh, we're we're in a, we're in a situation now where there's a lot of decentralized uh, power in the media, a lot of power spread around different ideologies and different camps, which I think is all to the good. I mean, I wrote a book called I'll give myself a plug here called The Thirteen American Arguments. Mm-hmm which is uh, published by Random House, available on Amazon. And it basically says that arguing is a good thing, that arguing is what defines us as a people. Mm -hmm. And what's better off if we have a wide spectrum of arguments going on in our public life. That's the way we move forward as a country. So I think it's a positive development. When I started in journalism, it's clear that the New York Times and the three TV networks ran the show. Uh, They did it from Manhattan, and they ran the whole country's media. That's not the way it is now. First of all, in New York, you've got Fox News, for one, uh, which is an ideological counterweight to the traditional mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And you've got the rise of the Internet, which makes everybody from Matt Drudge to uh, any number of conservative websites I could name very, very important in the process. So, you know, and as far as the Huffington Post is concerned, yeah, we come out of, I think the Huffington Post was begun by Ariana Huffington. Right looking for a way for liberals and progressives to have a voice on the Internet after the 2004 election. Uh, they saw what Matt Drudge was doing and wanted to do something different and better. Uh, and, you know, I think as an editor at the Huffington Post, I'm, I, I don't shy from those roots. Uh, everybody starts somewhere. Right. But the bigger we get, the more mainstream we try to get, the broader we get, we, without being ashamed of our heritage. I mean, everybody comes from somewhere in this game, and there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, and one last question, because you got me thinking when you said that, how I was going to let you go, but yep. sometimes when I watch the debate, it seems like the Democrats are arguing from a secular point of view, and the Republicans have created a scenario for themselves where, and people will say, not many ideas, but a lot of ideology, where it's almost a religion, and it's impossible if you're arguing from a secular point of view with someone who sees their philosophy as the tenets of a religion. Well, you make a very good point. Uh, I think in order for my theory of the virtues of argument to work in our society, we have to accept the basic humanity and decency, ultimately, the ultimate decency, or at least the humanity of the people we're arguing with. And what's happened a lot today is that uh, people only stay in their cocoon. In other words, the positive side of the Internet uh, and the, the sort of diffusion of media is that you can find all types of uh, views out there and all types of ways of approaching reporting the facts out there. But the downside of it, of that new world is that people can stay very comfortably within and be reinforced by, they have their thinking reinforced only by the people that they totally agree with. So, and, and what happens is that people come to view uh, people of differing opinions as not only having different opinions but ha- inhabiting different worlds. Which literally on the internet, if they spend all their day, all day, all day on the internet, they do. They inhabit different worlds, and that's 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 the problem. I think that's why leaders, leading, leadership in the country today is so difficult, but why it's so necessary. There's so few people who can who purport to speak for the whole country, and that's uh, that that's that's a, that's a dangerous situation. Go see him tomorrow night. Read the Huffington Post by 13 American <laughs> Arguments, right? <laughs> well, it's called the 13 American Arguments, right. which is even more of a stretch by me because I say there are only 13. <laughs> well, Howard, what a pleasure. I watch you on TV all the time. It's a pleasure to have you on the air. Uh, yeah, I'd thanks. love to see everybody tomorrow night. I'm really excited about being down right, there. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Take care. Have a great day. Howard Feinle right there on AM790 WNIS. I enjoyed that.